So in case you don't know it, uh, the interesting thing about Michael Borda, who has a very German name, um, he is an American citizen, and um, in the lineup we have here tonight, he's going to be our resident European, worrying about the future of Europe in a constructive sense, because that has long been one of his key research interests. What worries you the most right now, if you really don't want to say the glass is, is half full, but uh, almost totally empty? What's your totally empty thought? Well, I'm, I'm concerned that we can't even see the glass, and we won't see it for at least two years. Um, uh, <laughs> and, you know, uh, Prime Minister May is, um, is now committed to starting the Article 50 process by March, and after that they have two years to sew up all the the loose ends, because after that, uh, Britain re regresses to a WTO uh, member, and these are not great conditions to be doing trading. And um, I always think about Shakespeare. Um, uh, Henry the Sixth, uh, Dick the Butcher, said to Jack Cade, uh, "The first thing we do is we kill all the lawyers." <laughs> I'm afraid the lawyers are going to make a, a, a killing um, in two years to negotiate all the the deals, uh, even just if, the, if Britain accepts all the the existing regulations and then decide which ones they don't want, um, it's going to be a mess. So I'm, I'm concerned that a lot of rents will be created that lawyers will grab and uh, that's not really what you know, the economy is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be pr producing goods and services that we can use, not uh, aligning people to, to lobby and fight against each other as in proxy battles. So let me flip the question. Um, is there a scenario where Brexit undertaken by the British government, as regrettable as we may all feel it is, could have a positive effect on the future of Europe. I mean, one anecdotal piece is that the Poles have always been the strongest defenders uh, and lovers of the UK and stopped the Germans on many things at the European Council, standing by their man, Great Britain. And then they get, over the he uh, get hit over the head so nastily in that campaign and undeservedly uh, so that even a very conservative, anti-German, one must say, government as Poland currently has under Mr. Kaczynski and the people who are under him uh, serving in the official posts um, does not feel like it wants to stand up to the UK. But I, I don't want to get into the... I'm just mentioning this to see is there a good way forward because it leads to more cohesion and uh, other European countries may be forewarned in their lust for presumably more sovereignty and realizing that the Brits are up for a rough time. Could that be a positive cautionary lesson for Europe? Well, I'd hate to see it that way. I don't think anyone wants to be get, you know, getting someone back for this. It's not what you love to but, see. But it's what, what might happen. No, no, I'm, I'm, I should preface this with, because uh, this is the kind of attitude in the 1930s that led to a war. You know, This is the kind of thing we don't want. And I hear people talking in Britain as if, uh, I was just in Cambridge the other day, and people were talking as if, uh, this was like an act of war because you know Europe can take a, a conciliatory stance and say, okay, this is your decision, we'll go with it, or we can be real tough and try to cut off your legs. And I think it's a mistake to do that because it's going to fly back and it's going to hurt uh, the continent. So I, my 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 goal right now is to take three uh, arguments seriously that that go that are circulating in Britain, and they don't have to do with migration; they have to do with regulations, and they have to do with future economic options, and they have to do with Britain first. Um, maybe you can t lump in migration with that. Regulations are interesting because the, the European Union has a bad reputation. They don't market their regulations well. Uh, we know about the bananas and the olive oil and the cucumbers that are crooked. But people don't realize how important uh, the pharmaceutical industry is regulated by the European uh, Union. Labor law, environmental law, financial regulations. One of the reasons the financial crisis could have been worse um, uh, and wasn't. Um, was because um, certain regulations were already in place and these regulations are better. So I think uh, the UK uh, would be well advised to adopt at least uh, a positive stand toward those regulations. Secondly, and this is where I actually have to say, I, I, one has to get into the mindset of the people who lobbied for Brexit. Uh, the idea is that Europe is growing very slowly now. Germany is the trailblazer at 1.5%, and Britain used to have colonies that are now growing at six, seven, eight percent. China's growing at 10, well, now eight percent or six percent. These are the growing markets, and, and I think a lot of Brits uh, think, you know, why should we hitch our, uh, our, our train to a, to a loser and we should go off and do our own thing? Um, whether this is going to work or not, we can talk about, 
but uh, and the EU, EU is a constraint to free trade. If, if 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 Britain wants to launch into a free trade agreement with India, um, they have to get all the other 27 countries on their side, and Italy doesn't want to have free trade with India. Spain doesn't want to have free trade with India. So these are things you have to deal with. The last argument is the most irrational one, which is Britain first. You know, you can say, well, we value freedom. We want to have we want to have democracy. Well, it turns out that. The European Parliament is democratic. You, know, we can, you can lobby uh, in, in Brussels and you can get your uh, voice heard in many different ways. It's not inexorable that, that a lot of other European countries feel the same way. Um, and you know, there's an option value, maybe of being having some freedom, maybe that's what uh, the British are thinking about. But I'm, I'm concerned that this option value may be overvalued. So the, my, my take on this is there, there are three or maybe even four arguments you can make. I don't like the arguments against migration because Britain basically derives its lifeblood from migration, if you look at the, the British population. So those three arguments are the ones that I think uh, one has to take seriously. With a press that is foreign-owned uh, in the UK, Mr. Murdoch and so on, <laughs> all the good news that the European Union brought, uh, vacation rules that British capitalists would have never ceded to British workers, maternity rules and all of those things, that interestingly didn't matter and I found that quite shocking. But I want to go back to where in response to my question, could there be an upside for the future integration of Europe? You immediately shot back, not that I know you to shoot back usually. Uh, this would be like the 1930s. And I want to dwell on that for a moment. Because we have heard that in France, in Poland, in Italy, everywhere people are saying, hey, Brexit is great, uh, let's do our own version. And let me throw you a softball question at first on this. Um, is there any scenario where you would think that other nations could benefit from exiting the European Union? And what I mean by that is that it materially, not doesn't, that, it doesn't make, that it makes them feel better, but that it materially improves the life prospects and per capita GDP of whichever of the other nations. Let's leave Britain aside because it's really also about the ramification effects on the other 27 nations. Would anybody be better off to pull something like that? Can you see an economic scenario from all your macroeconomic knowledge and experience? I would, I'd, I'd appeal to trade, trade theory and, and just say, no, I can't. I just cannot imagine any scenario where exiting from a, as a small country from a customs union would unequivocally make you better off. Maybe there's some perverse situation where, uh, but even, the, even in the UK case, I, it's, a, it's a long shot that that uh, you know, they, could, they could organize agreements with, with India, China, Brazil, and, and maybe uh, Nigeria and the United States that would just trump all the, pardon, <laughs> pardon me for saying that, all the, all the, the losses they would get from uh, possibly losing uh, you know, preferred access to, to the uh, European continental market. And I think that's a really important point. These things take time to build up there. It's not costless to move into a market. You have to build up a network. And, um, British companies have enormous uh, gains in the, from trading with Europe and, and vice versa. I think these are, these are huge losses that one wants to take seriously. A friend of mine who was a while ago a British minister for Europe, uh, I called him up today, said, I'm going to moderate this panel. What's the biggest thought that you have? And he's very worried about this. And he said, you know, I wonder whether in 10, 20 years from now we come to look at this period of the choice that the UK has made as very similar to, and this is almost an opening for Dan, to the United States withdrawing from the League of, or not joining the League of Nations after the First World War and mm. the rest, as we shall say, is history. Um, so that's something that Dan can start answering in a moment. But for you, the question is this. As much as all of us would prefer a different scenario, the UK all of a sudden saying, we realize that Article 50 isn't going to get us anywhere. We're, we have these major benefits. We're throwing them away. Um, assuming that they stay the course, as Theresa May says every day, she has a chance to. Is Britain turning itself into the sacrificial lamb involuntarily so that other nations in Europe better see that this... Uh, you know, admiring sovereignty as an empty value in itself has very serious downsides for 
material life circumstances for everybody in that society except for those that have five houses in five countries? Well, I would hope so. I mean, I think, I think Britain has a, has a unique history, probably the, the mother of democracy. I mean, people say it's Greece, but I think it's really the UK. Uh, uh, we all learn so much from, from British culture and uh, British education. Germans send uh, their kids to the UK. These are all wonderful uh, things and I, I, yeah, my admiration for the country is enormous, but um, splitting off is going to hurt. And I think if the Netherlands did this or, or Denmark did this, the cost would be much more, because the the cultural benefit or the pride that you might derive from being, uh, you know, being independent, whatever that's worth, would never cover cover the costs. So I'm very confident that this will be a one-off event, unless unless, and again, this is. This is the, the precautionary tale, unless the, um, the, the Trumps of this world take, take, uh, you know, take this as a political element. And again, there's a lot of, there are a lot of problem areas in Europe where growth is slow, and uh, I'm thinking of Southern Europe, I'm thinking of Italy, and I'm thinking of um, you know, parts of Central Europe where there are things that could be better, and politicians are looking for the market, trying to look, fish for your vote and uh, could turn this into, into a, another situation. I just don't see this happening, though, right now. And I think, of course, it's up to Germany and France to take the lead and try to stop that. So the headline I take away is that Britain may be unfortunately stupid, but it will, be, will likely have a positive effect on others who are thinking about dangling too much with sovereignty and not understanding the, the risk might, consequences. The risk might be, of course, that, uh, that the Europeans um, don't negotiate tough enough you know, obviously there's a tight war. It's, it's a tightrope walk because if they, if they ask for too much, they'll cause ill feeling. And uh, if they give too much, then it's an open door for the next country to exit. And therefore the Europeans shall stay the course. We'll see. Thank you very much, Michael. Dan? Thanks.